and explorers the world over, and welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Lau, also known online as The Cosmobiologist, and we're brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Saganet.org. Before we get to our show today, as always, we love thanking everyone out there who shares about our show, who interacts with our guests, who shares the, the hashtag AskAstroBio in various, various social media platforms. Today, we want to give a big thanks to Sib Soccer Palette. I will say Sib Soccer is currently working with me at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science as a visiting scholar in my lab group. He's working through the Center for Life Detection, which is part of the Enfold RCN that we'll talk about later, uh, working on the life detection knowledge base. Uh, Sib Soccer has shared through his own social media channels and through others about our show. So a huge thanks to Sib Soccer, to everyone else who joins in for our show and watches and shares. We love you all. Now, today's episode is going to feature a friend and a colleague of mine who has had a remarkable journey as a scientist and a communicator of science. Joining us today from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory is Dr. Bonnie Teis. Her research is focused on improving the reliability of organic biosignature detections and researching how to tell if something is a sign of life in ancient rocks. She's originally from Australia, which we'll talk about a good bit during this episode, where she did her PhD in geology and astrobiology at the University of New South Wales. She loves to do work in the field and spend a lot of time out in the bush, in the desert, and at sea, thinking about life detection here on Earth and out there in the cosmos. One of her greatest passions is improving equity in geoscience, and she's worked in this topic in schools and museums, departments of education, university settings. She's done a lot as a science communicator, as well as being a researcher. She's also the early career co-lead for NASA's Network for Light Detection, NFOLD, uh, as well as being the co-lead for the Geological Society of Australia's Education and Outreach Special Interest Group. She's currently a postdoc fellow at NASA JPL in the Origins and Habitability Laboratory, where she researches life uh, and life detection in hydrothermal systems. So thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show, Bonnie. Thank you so much, Graham. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Finally, we've talked several times about bringing you on to talk about your research, your current work, your work in science communication, your work with Enfold and, and other realms. But as always, I love starting off our episodes asking our guests to share a bit about their personal journey into what brought them to where they are now. And I know that you actually have a very remarkable story for your, your transition through life into becoming a scientist and a researcher at JPL. Uh, would you mind sharing that with our audience? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess when I was growing up, I didn't really know anyone who had a university degree except teachers at school. Um, and I never imagined that science could be for someone like me. I actually dropped out of high school um, and worked full time at McDonald's while I did my uh, GED equivalent at um, a sort of vocational college in Australia called TAFE. And then um, I didn't do any science <laughs> at all in TAFE. Um, and I was always thinking about, uh, you know, working with books and, and doing English literature. And so when I finished my high school equivalent, I applied to university and I got rejected from every university I applied to. And so I ended up doing something called a bridging course, which is an option for many students. And the type of course I did was specifically for disadvantaged students. And so it showed us how we could learn to be at uni. So not only did I not finish high school, but nobody in my immediate family finished high school either. And so my family was incredibly supportive of me getting education, but we just didn't have the tools to prepare me to be able to get that education. 
And so in the bridging course, they actually taught me like what I should do to be able to study, to think critically, to evaluate texts. Um, and I ended up finishing that in half the amount of time I was supposed to um, because of academic excellence. It's funny what happens when a student actually gets the support they need. Um, and I started my undergraduate degree studying English literature. And I was at Macquarie University. And at Macquarie University, there's a requirement that you do a subject outside of your faculty. Or there was at the time I did my degree. Sadly, they've, they've done away with that requirement now. And I was studying English literature, thinking that I was going to do a PhD in science fiction and fantasy. I was really interested, and I still am really interested in the idea of using science fiction and fantasy as genres to explore morality and ethics for humans. Um, and so I, I found out there was this subject called Life, the Universe and Everything. And I was like, oh, I love that novel. Okay, I'm, I'm sold. I'm doing it. And so I, I sat down in this class and it was a general education science class for astrobiology. And I sat down and my course convener, Simon George, uh, he gave me a paper by Abigail Allwood, who was a scientist at JPL, and she's also an Australian. And it was her uh, nature paper from 2006, and it was about ancient stromatolites. And Simon told me that Abby was uh, the, in charge of an instrument that was going to go on the Mars rover and go to Mars. And I just had no idea that that was like actually an option for an international person. Um, and I just didn't know that this kind of science existed. And so I actually ended up adding this degree onto my arts degree um, and studying that from then on. And it was, it was really difficult, I have to say, trying to learn science without a background in science. I didn't understand anything anyone was talking about. I really struggled. I felt like I didn't belong uh, with lots of people. And I had to work very, very, very hard in a, to be able to understand. And I was very fortunate that Simon, he really went the extra mile to mentor me and really gave me a lot of opportunities and a lot of confidence in myself that I wouldn't have had um, otherwise. And so I ended up uh, doing a master's degree with Simon and we studied some Cambrian stromatolites and we looked at different like Mars rover techniques and how you might uh, try to detect life in the geologic record. And then for my PhD, I went to the Australian Centre for Astrobiology at the University of New South Wales um, and studied fossilised cell membranes throughout the geological record. And that's what I'm really interested in uh, today <laughs> and always. Oh, I love that so much. And I think it's important for our audience to remember that everyone's journey into being involved in astrobiology, whether we are career astrobiologists or not, we all come from many different backgrounds and have many different pursuits and interests. Um, and I, I love that you share that you're interested in science fiction as well. And that, that, that quote from Douglas Adams uh, tied to that chorus, Life, the Universe and Everything. I think many of us are fans of Douglas Adams' work. Um, and I also love that you mentioned the importance of mentorship for having developed your career and then bringing you to this realm of studying ancient rocks. And I know in preparation for the show, we were discussing this and you mentioned how you think of ancient rocks as potentially being an unreliable narrator. I wonder if you can kind of uh, expand on that idea for the audience. Yeah. So one of the books that I studied during my English literature de degree was one of the first novels. It was um, The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. And in that book, that's the first time that they have a lot of different chapters from different um, perspectives. So you have different narrators doing each chapter. And in that book, you're trying to work out who stole the moonstone. Um, but everybody's got their own truth for each of those chapters. So who's telling the real truth? And that's how I think about the geologic record, especially in deep time. You have all of these heavily altered rocks that, you know, aren't pristine anymore. And you're looking for evidence of truth. And you're looking to piece together stories from multiple lines of evidence to come closer to what the reality is. Um, and I just think that's the most fun thing of all. I kind of think about the geological record as if it was a book um, and I'm analyzing the text. So it's just like another way of doing English literature, really. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, our, our producer and director in leading up for this wanted me to mention this idea of maybe it's like a billion-year-old game of telephone. Um, <laughs> did you guys have the game of telephone in Australia? Is that a thing? You know what that is? Okay, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's like, you know, like these, these signals getting passed and changed through time as organic molecules are being changed and stuff like that and altered in the rock record through time. 
Um, so I, I very much love that idea, you know, trying to decipher what we're learning from the rock record um, and trying to understand these organic molecules. And that's kind of led you to a bunch of places. Um, I wonder if you can explain like your, your experience in field work and the places you've had a chance to go to. Yeah, so actually doing um, traveling for science was one of the reasons I really was attracted to science um, and getting to see the world and, and see what different things are, what it's like in other places. Um, so I've been really, really fortunate to get to travel to a lot of places in Australia. Um, in fact, my undergraduate degree at Macquarie University had a lot of field work um, as a component. And that was incredibly uh, beneficial, I think, to my career as a geologist, but it was also difficult financially. And so that's uh, a, something that's hard, I think, with field work because it can be something that can be so enriching, but it can also be something that uh, cuts people out or makes it harder for them to attend for a variety of reasons, not just financial. Um, but I got to travel a lot of places in Australia. And in fact, for our final uh, geology subject, we go to New Zealand because we don't really have mountains or volcanoes in Australia. And um, we go and we do uh, a trip where we start in the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand and we travel up through Mount Cook, uh, through all of the hot springs through New Zealand and through all of the volcanic terrains. And that was, you know, until that time, I hadn't really thought about hydrothermal environments or volcanic environments because I didn't really think that there would be that many fossils there. So I was really more interested in like, you know, fossilized lake systems and things like that. And so during that trip, I really started to think about uh, more hydrothermal environments in, in different places on the earth that I hadn't thought about before. And then for, during my PhD, I was able to go many times to the Pilbara in Western Australia. And you've had many people talk about the Pilbara on this show. It's really a fantastic place. It's my favorite place in the entire planet. I think if I could choose to be anywhere, it would always be in the Pilbara. Um, and I've been able to go to Yellowstone as well, uh, which was a fantastic experience for me because we don't have bison in Australia. We don't have squirrels. We don't have bears. Uh, so I had a very geologically enriching experience in Yellowstone. Um, and I also had a very like I guess, biologically uh, enriching experience in Yellowstone. Um, and I've also been really fortunate to be able to go to sea a few times. And so the first cruise I did, the first research cruise I did, we started in Western Australia and we transited below Australia through the Great Australian Bight to Tasmania. And my most recent research cruise, uh, we were actually off the coast of Oregon um, in Axial Seamount in the North Pacific Ocean. I love that. Uh, I am going to switch gears just for a moment to mention one of the polls. Uh, we asked our audience on YouTube a question uh, specifically about the Pilbara uh, and about the town of Marble Bar in Australia, which is very close to the Pilbara. It's where a lot of folks have been through. I heard from a bunch of friends when I was talking about this and put the poll up, uh, fellow astrobiologists who've been there uh, when doing field work in Western Australia. We wanted to know from our audience how many consecutive days it has been over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Marble Bar, Australia? Uh, the correct answer was 170 consecutive days. So sometimes called the hottest place in Australia because it maintains its heat for so very, very long. And that's part of being out in the field is going to places on our planet, extremely hot places and cold places, uh, places that are very far from civilization, places that are deep underwater, places that allow us to better understand life in all its various forms across our planet and trying to understand life elsewhere. And so, Bonnie, I'd like to switch gears now to the Origins and Habitability Laboratory uh, at JPL and some of your current work, including some of the cruises you've done. Uh, first off, I, I wonder if you can explain to us the, the premise of your postdoc at JPL. Yes, I'm uh, working on a project called Invader, which is the in-situ dive bot for exobiology research. And the premise of Invader is looking for life at deep ocean hydrothermal vents using uh, something called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, which tells you about the elemental makeup of a sample, and Raman spectroscopy, which is a type of vibrational molecule spectroscopy. So you get the molecules to vibrate and it tells you um, what's going on in, this, in the sample. And so what I'm trying to do is figure out how these complementary uh, techniques can work together to tell us more about whether there's life in hydrothermal vents. Um, and I do that through using field samples that we've collected from the deep ocean, but 
but also uh, through creating hydrothermal uh, samples in the lab. Um, and I'm very fortunate to be able to work with uh, two interns in the lab. So uh, Kathy Trio is working on how hydrothermal fluids might uh, migrate uh, uh, organic compounds, and Tali Ma is working on um, compositional gradients in different forms of hydrothermal chimneys, which she's growing in the laboratory as well. So we get to do a lot of um, laboratory simulations of what I see in the field, which is very fun, and it's a new way to, uh, for me, not a new way for other people, but for me to think about what's going on in the record, because usually I see something in the geological record, and I have the end member of what we see, but in the lab, I'm able to study the processes of what put that end member there. That's fantastic. Yeah. And Laurie Barge uh, was one of our previous guests on Ask an Astrobiologist and had a chance to talk about the chemical gardens, the development of these in-the-lab hydrothermal vent systems, which are pretty cool. Uh, I know our audience always loves seeing pictures of those. I love seeing pictures and videos of those. Um, so it's very cool that you have a chance to work on that. I will say, so when we were talking about uh, the prep for this episode, at first we wanted to pull our audience on the number of hydrothermal systems across the planet. And we really couldn't figure out how many they were. Even a quick Google search was like 300 or 500. I even called one of our past guests, uh, Dr. Jeff Wheat, who I know is an expert on hydrothermal systems. And even he wasn't really sure. And we were kind of trying to like you know, powwow together, kind of figure out what might be the number. Uh, and so we ended up in the end deciding to poll our audience, asking them what the deepest hydrothermal vent system in the ocean on our planet is. And so we gave them the choices of the Beebel hydrothermal vent field, the Lost City hydrothermal field, the Endeavor hydrothermal vents, or Magic Mountain in British Columbia. Uh, the correct answer was the Beeble hydrothermal vent field. Uh, it's where the Picard vent site lies. Uh, I will say if you hear that name, it does sound very much like uh, someone's favorite captain from Star Trek, uh, Jean-Luc Picard. I was reading about it. It turns out that he is indirectly named for the same family. Uh, Jacques Picard is the, the what this, this vent field was named for. Uh, his father, Auguste Picard, was and his twin brother are what Gene Roddenberry named Jean-Luc Picard for. Uh, so there's always a great way to toss in a Star Trek reference. Um, but Bonnie, you've had a chance now to go out on a cruise and actually do some work with the Invader team. I wonder if you can speak to your most recent cruise to the Axial Seamount for us. Yes, I actually was not with any of the other Invader team members on the most recent cruise to Axial Seamount. Um, I was on a cruise called uh, Pro to Atex 23, which was led by Julie Huber from MIT and Hui. And it was an absolutely fantastic experience. We were on the RV um, Thompson and we went out to Axial Seamount. And the great thing was that uh, we actually had the remotely operated vehicle Jason with us and the Jason team. Um, and I have never experienced anything like this before. We don't have a remotely operated vehicle like that in Australia. And being able to see what was happening on the seafloor was it just opened up another world to me that I never really considered or thought about when I was thinking about these uh, samples and where they were coming from. You know, when I go to see hydrothermal systems on land, you're right there, you're right where it is. And you're seeing everything, you're seeing the trees fall into the hot springs, you're seeing the bison walk through the hot springs. But when you, when I was thinking about the ocean, I'd really only seen still images. So being able to see the camera that the Jason had while it was investigating and, and see the kinds of sea life that would come and investigate and play with the Jason and uh, come right near the vents was so cool. Uh, so the ship was, was wonderful. And in addition to our science, we had to do shifts. So we were allocated shifts doing different things. And I was allocated the shift uh, doing event logging uh, for a couple of hours every day. And so I would come down to the Jason van, which was kind of like these demountables, and it would have all the cameras there and the Jason team would be there controlling Jason. And we would sit and we would log everything that the Jason was doing so that we would know exactly where samples came from, what the time was, what the temperature was. Um, and that was so fun. We got to see so many different things. Um, and then one of the other roles that I got to have uh, on the cruise was to work with the major fluid samplers. So these are these fluid samplers that can sample like 400 degrees Celsius fluid. And so they can get the hottest hydrothermal fluid coming straight out from a black smoker. And so so one of the great things about Axial is it's a it's a cabled environment, and so it's had long-term monitoring to see how the volcanic activity changes and how that changes the fluid and how that changes the environment. 
And so one of the things that we were doing on the cruise was getting samples from these really hot black smokers uh, so that we could analyze the fluid so that we could continue that picture. And so I got to, um, you know, take apart these major fluid samplers and help do the chemistry for the water to preserve it to till we could get back to land and scour them and clean them and, and put them back on, on the Jason. I think one of the most remarkable things to me was really the diversity of the colors of the hydrothermal vents that we could see. Um, and also just the amount of like sea life living there, like all of them were covered in tube worms and limpets and all these eukaryotic organisms that you don't, uh, well, I typically don't associate with hydrothermal vents. And so really thinking about them as complex ecosystems, uh, not just their astrobiological value was, was really mind boggling. That's so cool. Um, super jealous. One, um, you know, I've always, I've always loved ideas of exploring the ocean floor. I love the film The Abyss, which is very much an astrobiology movie to me, because um, we're exploring, you know, deep ocean life, not just for humans but for other beings as well. And honestly, you've now explored uh, across the planet Yellowstone, Western Australia, using robots to explore the ocean floor. We really are trying to understand life in all its myriad environments on our planet, and looking for life elsewhere. And that brings me to your current work with the Network for Life Detection. You are currently the lead of the Early Career Council for the Network for Life Detection. And I'm wondering if you can explain uh, what your role is uh, for Enfold for our audience. Yeah, so I have uh, had a lot to do with Enfold over the years. So when I was in Australia doing my PhD, more than half my PhD took place during COVID lockdowns where we couldn't leave the country. Uh, we couldn't really go far. We couldn't even leave our state for the, for the most of the time. And so one of the ways that I tried to stay connected to the astrobiology community as an international person was to participate in Enfold activities. And that brought me a sense of uh, community and a, and a sense of um, being in touch with what was going on even when I couldn't leave my country. And so I was very fortunate uh, when it came to the U.S. that uh, the previous lead, Joey Pastersky, uh, was stepping down and I was invited uh, to take over from Joey. And it's been a great honor of mine to help try to make things better and try to represent the early career communities uh, in astrobiology, particularly in life detection. And so I've been working with a fantastic committee uh, and we've been really thinking about what are the activities that we can do to bring the most value to the members of the Early Career Council. Um, and we've been working together to try to increase, uh, I guess, like communication and connectedness between early career researchers, because so often, you know, we sit at our desks and we're just writing or we're caught up in our experiments. And it's really important to stop and take a break and connect with other people because we get so caught up in that our work is ourselves. And then we forget that we are ourselves outside of our work. And so that's something that we've really been trying to emphasize. Uh, we had an event called Me Besides My Science earlier this year, where we were really trying to get people to get to know each other um, in addition to their science. Of course, the science is very important. It's, it's why we're there in the community in the first place. But we're also people too. And I think that's really important for connectedness. Awesome. Yeah. And you've done so much work connecting people in their early careers and young students and trying to help others learn about science in general. I think actually my first introduction to you might have been through your work with Luke Steller. Uh, you both were working together in developing scientific education content for sharing with, with other people. Um, I wonder what your vision is for, for why it's so impactful and important for researchers to be involved in sharing their science and teaching their science to younger generations. Yeah, I think for me, there are very few people who get out of my kind of background and who get to have the opportunities that I've been able to have uh, because of the support of people around me, my family, mentors at university. And I was very lucky to be able to have those opportunities and to be able to have a future I couldn't imagine. And I want that for other students from my background. I don't want anyone to not realize that they can have more if they want it. And so that's always been a guiding force for me since I've started doing science. And I think particularly with astrobiology, even people who are not interested in science are interested in astrobiology. 
And we know that teaching astrobiology to people uh, can help them and can empower them. I mean, I just look at Daniela Scalise's work in prisons and what that's done for imprisoned people and how that's helped them with their educational prospects. And same with Charlie Kell's work in Scotland prisons as well. And so I think that it's so important that we give back, you know, we, we are the keepers of knowledge and it's really important for us to, to share that knowledge with other people and to also respect other people's knowledge and what they might bring. And so it's not enough for us to just get up and talk at people. We really have to sit down with them and find out what their needs are and work with them together in a dialogic manner rather than um, getting up and just professing at them, I think is really, really important. And I, I've seen that over and over again in the work I've been so fortunate to do, uh, especially when I was working with the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. I was very fortunate to be able to run these STEAM classes, which is science and, science and art put together. And I worked on that uh, with Luella Moore, who was at the Powerhouse Museum, and we created these science and art workshops. And we noticed over time that most of the people who were coming to the workshops were homeschooled kids and their parents. And so the workshops that we were providing were creating a place of connection for the kids and the parents to learn together about science and then ask us questions. And that was something that was incredibly motivating as well, I think. I love that so much. It's so impactful. You know, sometimes the sage on the stage way of teaching can be helpful, but we really do need people to kind of engage and have dialogue and learn from each other to really get invested and interested in learning about our place in the cosmos. And so it's such valuable work. And I'm glad people like yourself are doing that work for all of us. Um, I will say, so when it comes to connecting to other people, uh, you and I have been connected, we've been friends for some time now. Um, one thing I saw since you've come to America and started working at JPL, uh, you've mentioned a few of the differences you've noticed in American society and language compared to Australia. For instance, you had pointed out to me that you, you keep meeting people who don't know what a fortnight is. Um, <laughs> I will say, I do know what a fortnight is, many Americans do, but not most, I would say. And we really don't ever use it in our language. And so in preparation for having you on the show, we asked you to provide a few Australian terms, some Australian lingo that maybe Americans wouldn't know. And I put a poll up on my ex account about this, uh, asking which of the following was not Australian lingo, uh, hard yakka, sarvo, wattler rig, or tucker box. Uh, and I know that a lot of people were like, I had no idea. And I think, uh, I think the ones who got it right actually are Australians uh, who, who <laughs> chimed in. Uh, Wattler rig was made up. I made that up with the help of ChatGPT, actually. Uh, the other ones are real. Uh, hard yakka, and help me out here. That's hard work. Yeah, hard yakka is hard, hard work. Yakka? So yeah, hard work. I, if I'm going out in the field, I'm doing hard yakka all day. And then Sarvo is this afternoon, and a tucker box <laughs> is like a lunchbox or a food pail. Correct. Love yeah. It. So <laughs> love if, it if you're so going much. out in the field, you'll be like, I'm hard yak all day. I couldn't get into my Tucker box, Savo. I love it. <laughs> it's so <laughs> awesome. I mean, we have to think about how we use language differently in different places that we're from, uh, not just different uses of a language, but different dialects, accents, ways of engaging with each other. It's important when we're trying to understand how we might communicate with alien life one day. How do we even communicate with other humans and understand each other? Uh, now, Bonnie, before we go to our faster than light segment of rapid fire questions, I do want to talk really quickly. You mentioned your interest in science fiction uh, and, you know, reading about science fiction. You mentioned to me before the show that you're also into video games, that you've put some time into Baldur's Gate 3, for instance. I personally love video games. And when it comes to like uh, morality and ethical questions about, you know, space, about, about our understanding of our environment, there's a lot to explore in video games. I was just chatting with a student from Columbia the other day who wants to write an essay about moral questions that come up in the Mass Effect universe. Uh, I'm wondering, what are your favorite games for kind of exploring uh, big philosophical questions and science together? Oh, I think the one that comes to mind first is only big philosophical questions. Um, and that's This War of Mine, which is an incredibly... A uh, poignant and emotional game where you play civilians uh, trapped in a building during a war and you have to try to make it through the war from either teaming together or maybe you don't team together, um, but the civilians have to live with the decisions that you make. And I remember the first time I made it through that game um, and I actually couldn't consume any content for a couple of days afterwards because it was so emotional, the kind of philosophical questions that it had placed on me. It actually affected me more than any movie I've ever seen. 
Um, and I think that video games have a particular power to be able to, to do that. Um, as far as science goes, you know, I don't typically play scientific video games because I'm trying to switch off after work. Um, so I usually am playing, you know, I I still play Age of Empires 2 very frequently. Um, you know, it's 20 years old, but it's a classic for a reason. Uh, and I particularly really like roguelike games. So uh, Hades was a particularly great one. And that was, of course, filled with morality and philosophy philosophy, sorry, that just didn't happen for me, uh, because it was stewed in Greek myth as well. And so I think games are particularly strong when they can give us something to think about and to chew over while we're playing them. Of course, I do also um, really enjoy just playing strategy games. Uh, I really like that. I think it feel, fits in with a scientist's mind of like thinking strategically about how to conserve resources or move things for the future as well. Oh, I love that so much. And that's very fitting for some of the questions we're going to ask now in our Faster Than Light segment. Um, again, for the audience, these are kind of rapid fire questions. Uh, we ask them of every guest just to kind of see what our different guests think about these different things. So for starters, of course, Enrico Fermi once asked that question, where are they? Now, the big question for you is, what is your favorite answer to Fermi's question, where are they? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm always thinking about geological time. And so I always think the chances that it's us at the same time as someone else that's in range for us to contact, that becomes a little bit more difficult. So maybe it's just not the right time. We have to be at the right time and the right place and able to, to be able to find others. Absolutely. And now we are storytellers. We've always been storytellers. It's what humanity is. And maybe that's part of why we're scientists and explorers too. Uh, and from, you know, books, video games, movies, there's so much out there. But Bonnie, what stories have inspired you to want to learn more about life in the universe? You know, I think the story that most inspired me to want to learn about life in the universe is actually The Little Prince. Uh, which is a story about a little prince who lives on an asteroid that's so small that he can just watch sunset after sunset after sunset. And a rose grows on his asteroid and she's so vain um, and she wants so much from him that he ends up leaving to explore the rest of the universe. And it's really a story about imagination and about creativity and how we think about ourselves and our place and where we are. And so that book in particular, I think is one that really strongly stuck with me as to why we might want to explore elsewhere and what it can bring to us personally to explore elsewhere. Yeah. Such an impactful book and it's inspired many people through generations now. Um, if you could go back in time and visit yourself at the start of your career, what kind of advice would you give? I think I would tell myself to know that I belong and it's not up to other people to let me know that, that I belong. It's something that I decide for myself. Uh, that was something I struggled with for a long time and still struggle with. And so being able to overcome that and have something in myself that brings me connectedness and brings me belonging, I think would give me a lot of easier of a career. And I hope that's something that other people can think about and it might help them as well with their career. Very cool. Um, now, we're not trying to pick a fight here, but if there is alien life out there, do you think we'll discover it first in our own solar system or on an exoplanet elsewhere? Yeah, that's a hard one to know. I'm kind of biased because I study in our own solar system. Um, and I I don't think I could answer for kind of uh, exoplanet detection because that's a very different kind of life detection. It's a lot more atmospheric and a lot of a different way of approaching. Uh, so I only really know about the kind of in situ life detection or what you might do with a, a closer by mission. Uh, so very biasly, I like to hope it involves rocks and not the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I love it. Um, now, you know, for astrobiology in this realm, like thinking about astrobiology, thinking about what's possible out there, it really makes us think a lot about ourselves and about time, uh, our past, our present, and our future. So what is something that excites you about the future? Everything. If we think about how young astrobiology is as a field and what it's already been able to do, the kinds of advances we've had in astrobiology and thinking about how 
We need to be more scrupulous where it comes to science. We need to be more rigorous. We need to question our claims. Those are things that have improved science as a whole, not just our field. And so the search for life elsewhere, how it's going in the future, is something that will impact not just us in the field, but the way that we think about science in general. And so I think there's so much room for that. You know, the kinds of missions that we're able to do now, the planetary bodies that we're able to visit now, that's just going to open up a world of understanding that we haven't yet had. And so I think the, the possibilities are endless and it's a really exciting time to be doing astrobiology. Absolutely. Now we are going to open it up to our audience questions here in just a moment. But first we have my favorite question from the Faster Than Light segment. So Bonnie. What is an unbelievable science fact that still blows your mind? Okay, so this is a this is a popular one, and I think it's a popular one for a reason. This was the kind of first science fact that I ever heard that made me just kind of go, oh, whoa, geologic time is unfathomable. And that is that there is more time between when Stegosaurus existed and when T-Rex existed than when T-Rex existed and we exist. And I, I, that just was mind boggling to me because every movie I'd ever seen, everything I'd ever read always kind of depicted all the dinosaurs together. And to think that they existed for so long and were so diverse that that fact could be true was something that just made me sort of stop and think, Wow, I think I understand geologic time, but I really don't. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, a human perspective of time is so difficult. We we really did evolve to think of time in these very short segments. You know, seconds are fine, minutes are fine, but even they start thinking of days. I, I can't tell you what I was doing forty eight days ago exactly, um, or even you know, years get really hard. We think we're pretty good, but you start thinking back on the years, and I really can't lay out what my year was like three years ago necessarily. I, I know a few things, but uh, and then start thinking in deep time, it gets even harder. And so I think through science, through topics like astrobiology, it helps us to better frame those things. And so I love that fact so much. Uh, so thank you for sharing. Now, we are going to open it up to our audience who are watching live on YouTube right now. Uh, we're going to start off with a question from Jim Pass. Uh, Jim wants to know, uh, how well do you think ongoing discoveries of extremophiles on Earth will assist in recognizing alien life on Mars, Europa, or elsewhere? Um, and what does your work entail, especially how and how? Oh, and then Jim, being an astrosociologist, also wants to know the importance of social interactions that you have in your work and how that enhances your success. Yeah, so with the importance of extremophiles, I think the more that we can learn about the limits of life and what life can adapt to, the better. That really helps us in, in guiding where we could search for life in other places. I think we always have to understand there are limitations when we think about life on Earth and how that relates to other places. And we have to think about that in a very context-specific way. And so as long as we're applying those limitations and the context to our analog work on extremophiles, I think that we can utilize that information in a very helpful way. But if we sort of blanketly go, oh, there's a methanogen here on, on Earth, it must be in the same place on Mars, without thinking about that context, I, I don't think that's the best way to do it. But the good news is nobody is really doing that. Everybody's thinking about it in a context-specific way, uh, at least the, the papers that I read. And so I think that that's a, a really interesting approach into thinking about where could life be? What are the limits of where life could be? And also, how does life proliferate in these kinds of extreme environments? And what are the specific adaptations it needs? When it comes to social interactions um, and the work, I, I think, you know, I've already spoken about how the, I, I frankly wouldn't be here without the kind of mentorship that I've had and the kind of investment that people have, have put into me. And I feel the same moving forward. The things that are most impactful in my day are working with interns and working with students and seeing them make discoveries and seeing them make connections. That's really what I look forward to. I, I work in a lab environment and one of the reasons I choose that is to work with other people every day. And so you're in the lab, you're doing your experiment, everybody is talking around you. There's a very collegial environment and it's very nice to be able to actually just turn around to someone and say, 
I'm really stuck. I don't understand this thing. Could you please help me with it? And they come from it from their perspective and you come from it from your perspective and you work together to, to try to understand this new piece of knowledge. Um, and I, I think that's the best part of doing science, to be honest. Yeah. Not working in a vacuum, working together is really important and collaborating together is so important. Um, now with the work in the, your lab, uh, Sib Sonker Pallet is watching and wants to know if you could give us a, a little bit of an idea of how uh, building hydrothermal vents in the lab happens. Yeah, so um, you can create a, some seawater that you might put uh, like a metal in um, and then you'll create like a synthetic hydrothermal fluid that you'll put silica in or whatever else would be in that hydrothermal fluid you're looking at and you actually inject the hydrothermal fluid into the seawater and that causes uh, precipitation. And so over time that precipitation, depending on how you set up the experiment, uh, can build a vent. You might not want to build a vent. You might want to just build um, some hydrothermal sediment. So you might do that in a different way. Uh, so you might actually just sort of pipette that into a beaker and then see what happens there. So sometimes you might want to study how the, the structure of minerals, uh, like morphologically, the, the shape of them affects something. But other times you might just want to study how the presence of those minerals affect something. And so there's different ways that you might approach that research depending on what your questions are very cool um now let's go beyond the laboratory to real settings uh some people have argued that the origin of life likely happened in the ocean around hydrothermal vents you may also know that there are other astrobiologists who've argued differently that perhaps life can't start in oceans it needs to start on dry land in wetting and drying cycles for instance uh, like the the, the uh, hot spring hypothesis by Bruce Damer and Dave Deemer. Uh, now we have a question from KT Shady, who wants to know for you as someone who studied both terrestrial and seafloor hydrothermal geothermal settings, uh, if you have an opinion of which might be more scientifically convincing for the origins of life. I don't have an opinion on which is more scientifically convincing for the origin of life because I'm not an origin of life researcher. So all of my mm, opinions would probably be irrelevant and misinformed, to be honest. Uh, but I think that it's really important to study both systems. Uh, there's a constant discussion in astrobiology of an either or approach. And I think that there's so much benefit to be gained from understanding hydrothermal systems as a whole rather than splitting them. Of course, there are some differences between a land-based uh, hot spring system and a deep ocean hydrothermal vent, but many things are the same. And so I think it's really important that we consider these systems and how they relate to the specific questions that we're asking. If we're thinking about origin of life, maybe we think about what kinds of environments were present in the early earth and what kinds of minerals were in those environments and what that would mean for an origin of life. If we're thinking about life detection on Mars, maybe we think about different questions about probably the same question about mineralogy, to be honest. Um, but we might also think about what are the different kinds of hydrothermalism that might be present on Mars. Um, and we could think about the same with Enceladus and possibly Europa. You know, Enceladus is probably a very alkaline system, whereas uh, Europa is probably a more acidic system. And so you would study different hydrothermal systems as different analogs for, for those as well. So I think that there would be a lot of benefit and a lot of us considering uh, both sides of the, of the coin, I would say. Awesome. Uh, our next question comes from Dessel Drace, uh, who has a question about serpentinizing vent systems. Um, so for our audience, serpentinizing systems are those where water and rock are interacting. Uh, in this, they can produce hydrogen. Uh, we know that things like methanogens, uh, which can consume hydrogen and carbon dioxide together and produce methane, uh, can be found in these environments. They're very intriguing environments for astrobiology. They might exist in the seafloors of Europa or Enceladus, but we know that there are serpentinizing environments in the past on Mars. Um, now, the question from Dessel is uh, asking about uh, microenvironments of varying pH around these systems. Um, so, Bonnie, I wonder if you can speak to how extensive such microenvironments might be and whether there are a lot of varying pH environments around these vent systems. 
Yeah, so not for for pentanizing systems specifically, but for hydrothermal vents in general, there can be a lot of pH gradients. Um, So as the fluid travels through the hydrothermal uh, chimney um, or if it gets, you know, uh, produced through a diffuse like vent and uh, taken out into the water, the pH is going to change very rapidly because you're going to have a fluid that's maybe acidic or alkaline and then it's interacting with seawater. And so that's very quickly going to change the pH. But as you travel along the vent and along the mineralogy, the water is, the pH is also going to be affected by what mineral the fluid is in contact with as well. And so that can change very quickly um, over a vent system. And we see this in hot springs and land as well. You might have a hot spring pool that's one pH, and then you might have one next to it that's a radically different pH, and they might splash and mix. And so I think that's something that people find very exciting about uh, hydrothermal systems is you can have these really radical shifts um, in these kind of pH gradients, which can um, induce, uh, you know, a lot of, um, it enables a lot of different changes in the environment that life could uh, possibly utilize. And so that's something that people look for. So one of the ideas with hydrothermal vent systems is you might have like these pockets or these giant pores in the mineral structure where some water might get trapped or some fluid might get trapped. And then that might interact with the seawater as well. And then you'd have like radically different pHs on either side. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much to explore in the, these environments around these hydrothermal systems. Um, changing gears just a moment, uh, Sib Soccer Palette wants to know, uh, what do you think the best ways are to ensure equitable access to astrobiology knowledge uh, for people, especially for students? Oh, yes. So the leading practices in equity and education are being – Well, currently, there's been quite a huge redefinition in them because of the massive shift to online learning as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, So I had taught uh, online even before COVID. Um, And one of the great things about online education, particularly in the university setting, is that it allows a lot of people to have access to university that might not have had access to it before people who work full time, perhaps they have a disability, uh, perhaps they're mothers that have caring responsibilities or fathers that have caring responsibilities. Um, And so being able to learn online asynchronously gives them options they wouldn't have had uh, when they were going to uni face to face. Um, I know I worked full time while I was at uh, doing my undergraduate and many people do. And my job was, uh, you know, an hour and 20 minutes away from the university. And so that made it very difficult to study and very difficult to be able to get to classes. So one of the things online learning can do if it's taught well is increase equity by giving everyone a seat at the table. But what happens is many times it's not taught well um, or it's taught in a way that uh, actually increases inequity. Uh, One of the things that happens is people teach the way that they were taught and a lot of people weren't taught online. Um, And so once people learn how to teach uh, in ways that are more equitable or put their effort in towards that, that can really increase the amount of people that are able to have access to education. I think one of the other important things is the university isn't the only way to be educated. There are many fantastic science communication courses and activities that are put on by a lot of different institutions um, around the world. And so there are a lot of other ways that we can access education and become more informed, even if we don't want to commit to a university degree. Um, And so I think it's really important that we always remember that it's not a one size fits all way to teach. It's a many sizes for everyone. Um, And I will say one of the things that we or that I have in particular worked on over the years is virtual field trips. And so we have created these 360 degree panoramic um, virtual field trip settings so that people can go to the field even if they don't want to go to the field. And that creates an element of choice. And I think choice is the most important thing in learning. If you arm people with choice, you're giving them the the choice literally uh, to choose what is most appropriate for them. 
I love that. Yeah, I, I personally imagine in a very near future, it'll be fairly easy to pop on a VR headset and some haptic gloves and jump into Western Australia with people who are all, you know, avatars around you. And you're actually exploring real rocks, even though you're not physically there in person for these virtual explorations and experiences, which really can open up education a lot. And so I love that so much. Uh, one of our users, Rendering Reality 3D Animations on YouTube, um, wants to know, uh, given you know the possibilities for the origins of life and hydrothermal vent systems, um, he mentioned specifically serpentinizing systems, but um, do we know anything about how lower than, than 1G environments in places like Europa or Enceladus might impact uh, hydrothermal vent processes? Yeah, I haven't actually um, worked on those kinds of systems before, so I wouldn't be able to answer that question accurately enough to give an informed answer. Yeah, and I, I can personally say I'm not sure uh, if anyone's really done very good modeling for different gravitational regimes for hydrothermal vent systems. And so it might be worth looking out there in the research, maybe maybe using some powerful tools to go explore and see what's been done so far. And that might uh, lead to some new places for new research for this user. Um, so Desil Drace has asked another question um, about how vents pull in ocean fluids uh, and the intermixing for ocean fluids. Um, so for those watching, so hydrothermal vent systems around these, these ocean spreading centers, it's where the fluid from the seawater goes into the crust, gets heated up around the mantle, it comes back out. When it comes out, it brings along with it, one, the high temperature, high energy kind of environment, but also a lot of these elements being kind of stripped out of the rocks. They come through. Uh, what do you think of, of intermixing of these fluids and, and at what scope do, do these fluids intermix in the ocean, Bonnie? Yeah, not just uh, elements, it brings through organic molecules and all sorts of things that, that get picked up. And I guess it depends on the size of the plume and how far it's going because different, one of the cool things about different vents is that they're all sort of different. They have different personalities, which I like. Some might have more uh, aggressive uh, eruptions um, and some might be a bit more subtle. So it's gonna depend on the individual system. But I know from when we were on the cruise, you could actually see the enrichment of life through tens of meters from the vent. So it's not just a completely localized um, type of thing. It's something that can spread out like quite far on the seafloor. Um, and when you come up to these sorts of vent systems, you see, you start to see all the life kind of like coalescing on the, on the vent. And so you have all these limpets and different kind of mollusks and, and tube worms and everything. And you can really see where the environment starts to get enriched with everything that's coming from these fluids. Um, the temperature change is very rapid. You know, I was very shocked. You would have fluid erupting that was like 320 degrees Celsius. And just a few centimeters away, the water would be back down to two degrees Celsius because the volume of the ocean is so like large compared to this, this tiny, like little vents. Um, and so I, the, the mixing can't be so consistent across the whole ocean, like globally that, it, that it changes it. Um, and also in hydrothermal environments on land, uh, you can really see that temperature change happen as the water sort of travels from where the geyser is, which is like the land-based vent. Um, the water will shoot out and it will travel down across what we call the Sinta apron. And it starts to cool down in different temperature regimes. So where it's at the geyser, it might be like 100 degrees Celsius. And then when you get to the edge of the pool, it's going to be ambient temperatures, so maybe 20 degrees Celsius. And we also see a very large difference in the kind of organic molecules that get traveled with the fluid, depending on where we are in the vent systems. And so uh, there's a lot of different things and very context specific things, depending on which specific vent or vent field you're looking at. That's fantastic. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Let's see. Uh, Felipe Benitez, uh, Felipe, hey, um, has asked if you can elaborate on specific adaptations that we know organisms must have to thrive in hydrothermal systems. Yeah, so some, um, some organisms might be adapted to live at a higher temperature than others. So, you know, there's a limit for life. Um, and how even adaptions like can live. So you can't really find many organisms above like 100 degrees Celsius. Um, 
And so you have different organisms that can adapt to those changing temperatures as well. So it's not just enough to be able to live at the high temperature, but the temperature is going to go away rapidly once the vent stops, uh, you know, guising. And so the organism needs to be adapted to go back down to normal temperature and survive those temperature fluctuations. Um, you might also have, you know, in the deep sea floor, you're going to have organisms that don't need light. Um, to eat. <laughs> and so that's, I mean, that's something that's really cool to think about that kind of uh, system that's in the deep ocean as opposed to on land, because it's so different than what we see every day. Some of the other kinds of adaptions that uh, organisms might have are adaption to highly alkaline uh, fluids and highly acidic fluids as well. Um, and so those kinds of uh, changes in internal pH chemistry uh, can severely affect like an organism's range and being able to, to tolerate those is like, a large adaption. Um, and then in addition to uh, heat, if we're thinking about somewhere like Europa or Enceladus, there are also adaptions to cold as well. Um, so even if it's near a hydrothermal environment, that temperature fluctuation is going to be even larger. And so thinking about organisms that can really sustain these very, very large changes in a system very, very quickly. Awesome. Um, so we have one more question. It seems like everyone wants to see if we can pick a fight here, but uh, <laughs> Anurag Mahanti is one of our production assistants. He's also now a, a just started graduate student at Northwestern University. Uh, Anurag wants to know if you had to place a guess on finding life in our in celestial neighborhood, uh, if there's a planet or moon that would be your favorite uh, or where we might find life and what's unique about it? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, so I think it depends on whether we're talking about the likelihood for life to be in the planetary body or if the likelihood for us to find it, because I think those are two different things. Um, if we think about the way that we're able to access some planetary bodies, it might be more limited than the ways that we can access others. Um, and so our ability to find something doesn't mean that it's not there. And so I think those two things uh, could be decoupled. Um, I've worked on Mars for a long time. Um, I have a very large soft spot for Mars. Um, I've thought about Mars for a long time because, you know, if we're, if we're looking for fossilized life on Mars, it was likely from a similar time period than uh, what we think about in Western Australia. And so I think there's a lot of potential there, especially with the ways that we can explore Mars, which are different ways than we can explore elsewhere. Um, Enceladus, of course, is somewhere that everyone is very excited about, particularly with the new phosphate discovery. Um, and so Enceladus is another place that I think would be somewhere that would be great to, to look. Uh, if we think about Europa, this would be a different kind of life again, and that would be a different challenge in how we access the life. Uh, so I think there's a lot of good candidates in the solar system. There are actually even more candidates that uh, I could bring up. Uh, I have a really soft spot for Ganymede as well. The first assignment I ever did uh, was to design like an astrobiological, uh, in astrobiology, uh, was to design an astrobiological mission to Ganymede to look for life. So I, I also have a soft spot for Ganymede. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm a fence sitter and I'm not going to pick for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no fights. I love it. Um, yeah, there's so many cool options, right? Um, I will say for Europa, uh, a lot of our audience might know that we are very soon going to be launching the Europa Clipper. It's a mission many of us have been following for a long time. We're very excited for it to go out. It's going to orbit around Jupiter and Europa together and do many, many flybys of Europa, give us more knowledge of the surface, um, the environment around Europa, high resolution imaging of the entire moon. Finally, we're going to learn so much more about Europa. Uh, to that effect, for those watching, uh, there is a really cool thing you can do right now. It's called Message in a Bottle. You can go to europa.nasa.gov slash message in a bottle with hyphens between the words. Uh, and you can enter your name to be engraved on a chip to be sent along with the Europa Clipper. So your name could travel around Jupiter and Europa and be part of this mission, helping us learn even more. I even have my own uh, little message in a bottle with my name on it that's going to Europa. I do this for every mission because NASA comms is awesome and lets us do this. Um, and also, if you go to that site, you can also read the poem, In Praise of Mystery, a poem for Europa, 
written by the poet laureate Ada Limon, uh, and learn more about Europa Clipper along the way too. So definitely do that. Add your name as a message in a bottle to be sent to Europa, which might be one of the possible places where we could find life in our solar system. Um, now, finally, uh, if you'd like to learn more about the recent cruise, the, the Proto Atax cruise, uh, I think we're going to share the cruise's blog link soon. Uh, and then also, if you'd like to learn more about Bonnie Tees herself, you can visit her website, astrobonology.com. Uh, you can also find her on social media online, uh, follow all the awesome science and work that she's doing. Bonnie, thank you so much for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Thank you so much, Graham. This has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm so glad we finally had a chance to have you on the show. Uh, for those watching right now, uh, if you want to learn more about Ask an Astrobiologist, we have our own webpage on the NASA Astrobiology website. But you can also sign up for the NASA Astrobiology mailing list. This will include information about every episode of Ask an Astrobiologist, about our guests coming up on the shows, uh, as well as events and opportunities, research, and all kinds of things going on through the NASA Astrobiology program. So I thank so much, Dr. Tease, for joining us. I thank our audience live and later in the future for joining us and watching this episode. Thank you all. And until next time, remember... Stay curious.